how do we make it financially? That is, how do you buy a house, especially in Melbourne? How do you, like, 800 grand? How do you pay it off? How do you have a family? How do you have enough left for retirement? Everyone has a strategy. Everyone's got an idea. Mums, dads, friends, cousins, work colleagues. The learning of how to get there is a process in itself. And you have to actually be doing stuff. And you have to actually chart a course, which, which is unknown. And I know that's scary. At the end of the day, you buy an asset now. If it's the right asset, you know it's going to be worth a lot more uh, when you're going to move. Today's guest is Michael Sims, owner of Sims Property Group. I love property people because the industry is built on people who've tried to escape that normal nine to five to answer the question of how do you make it financially in this lifetime? Throughout this conversation, we talk about the importance of the right people around you. We tackle the question of should you buy your first home in this market? We share the hidden secret that is the cornerstone of the rise of the buyer agents within the industry and how they stack the odds heavily in their clients' favor. Enough from me, let's get into it. Hello. How are you, Will? Thanks, Ian. Thanks very much for your time too, buddy. I really appreciate the opportunity to come on with you. No, that's all right. Look, at the end of the day, you know, we've met and we've connected. I think you can add something to my audience. And obviously the main question where I can feel that I can add value to my audience is, basically asking that question that most of us have, unless we've got rich parents, right? And that is, how do we make it financially? That is, how do you buy a house, especially in Melbourne? How do you, like 800 grand, how do you pay it off? How do you have a family? How do you have enough left for retirement at the end? And I know there's a lot of content out there, but I kind of feel there's something missing because there's a lot of people selling strategies and they bring on someone like this morning, it's like, oh, I bought 10 houses in, you know, two years. That's not actually the way most people are going to to experience their journey towards, I shouldn't say being wealthy, but just getting what they need out of their finances um, to live a comfortable life. Without further ado, give us give us the uh, one or two minute rundown of, of Michael Sims. Perfect. So that, and again, thanks, Will. Uh, one thing I'll just kick up with before I introduce myself is property is the, if not the highest opinionated industry on the planet outside of maybe coffee and where the best barista is in town everyone has a strategy everyone's got an idea mums dads friends cousins work colleagues one of my biggest tips is probably to listen to industry professionals who do this day in day out i just wanted to get that in there first because what you said triggered triggered that memory my first ever job i followed my father's footsteps in his career i worked on the waterfront down in the docks in melbourne here which was for me, a fantastic opportunity to give me a bit of a leg up financially because it was a, a well-paid job. But what I found for me personally was there was no real passion in it. So it's taken me nearly 40 years to work out what my passion is and how to apply it into a, into a job. Uh, yes, the money was great and we can talk about my fails and then there was a couple of failures and, and successes. But, but for me, the, the ability to help someone was my biggest passion. I wasn't sure how to make that work. Working on the docks was just a pay packet. So yeah, it's taken me 40 years. I'm not sure how 17-year-olds and 18-year-olds walking out of high school know what their career for the next 40 years is going to be. They've got to pick a uni degree and set their life up and a plan. 40 years it took me. Uh, but yeah, so I was on the docks for 20 years. I found out property was my biggest passion. Helping people was another big passion. So it was a natural fit. It's just taken me a little bit of time to get to that conclusion. That's probably it. And since launching Sims Property Group, Oh, I think we were speaking the other day. My favorite part was telling a first home buyer who'd missed out on multiple properties before they engaged me, uh, that phone call to say, we've got your home. And she cried. And I am very masculine and I may have had a tear myself. <laughs> I definitely shed a tear uh, with her. Just that experience. And that's what I do it for. Uh, I just want to help people, whether it's building wealth through portfolios, whether it's helping them find their next family home or their first home, first home buyers. How do you buy a property in the current market, if you've never done it before, you're going to be listening to your mum and your dad and your work colleagues, maybe a friend who's got a couple of properties, and they're all going to tell you different things. It's, it's a really, really tough industry. It's a really, really tough market, especially now with interest rates. We're nearly at the peak, from what I can tell, for the fixed rate cliff that's coming up. I read the article in REA yesterday that uh, July, August, September was the peak, in their opinion, where $30 billion per month was going to be um, flicked over to from fixed into um, variable rates. So that's going to be fascinating to see how that pans out. And I mean, for you, Will, as a mortgage broker, I'm assuming that at some point your phone's going to run red hot with people saying, I need some help. <laughs> it's been running red hot for a while now with people <laughs> people saying, I need some help. Before we go back to the current state of the market, because I think that's really important um, and people want to know about that. 
you mentioned a couple of things there. The, the one thing I pick, picked up out of that is this day and age, we have so much information. Like there is content at us. There's um, content, uh, yeah, disguised as advertising that are getting pushed our way. And at the start, you said talk, talk, talk with your professionals or rely on your industry professionals. But I kind of want to go a bit further back because that journey of actually getting to you know, being comfortable financially or getting to, to a place where you're like, okay, I don't have to worry so much about the future. The one thing I picked up is that it's actually a process. And that's kind of what you mentioned. It's taken you all this time to get there. I think what's important for people to understand is there's this misconception that I see and people think, oh, when I do it, it's going to be the right way of doing it. Yeah. And then what, a lot, what happens to a lot of people is they don't actually take any steps because they're scared that they're just going to stuff it up or it's going to be be the wrong thing. So I'm just saying from an experience point of view, the learning of how to get there is a process in itself and you have to actually be doing stuff and you have to actually chart a course, which, which is unknown. And I know that's scary. I'm just curious, like if there, if there's any kind of pivotal moments in your past where something happened or you made a mistake or whatever that you just thought, oh crap, I've only learned this just now. This happens to me all the time, by the way, I've only learned this just now. Imagine what have, what would have happened if I learned it 10 years ago. Maybe I'll be like that guy around the corner who's super successful now. I'll put you on the spot. If enough for me, mate, it was leaving my interest rate in my home, my family home. So we bought a, a acre block in Torquay, Victoria, which is a surf, a um, coastside town, beautiful little coastal town. At the time, I thought I paid overs for the, for the acre block and we put a nice big house on it. Um, in hindsight, we paid well and truly under um, and the growth through that property was substantial, but my biggest probably downside was I didn't change the interest rate. We, we were on an interest rate that was exorbitantly high. Um, I didn't understand how the system worked. I went to a bank. That was my first failure. I didn't use a mortgage broker because I didn't know they existed. So I went straight to the bank thinking the bank had my best interest at heart, can confirm they don't. <laughs> you are just the number to them. And throughout probably a period of about six to 10 years, at no point did I look at revisiting that interest rate, which would have given me a lot more um, equity through the property because there's more money in my pocket. That was probably my biggest downfall in that first first big property that we bought as a family. Um, the banks, yeah, going to the bank was was number one. But one for me, to be honest, Will, had I known you existed back in 2004, six, I think it was, or I wish I'd known you existed. It would have been a, a different story for me back then. Yeah, I think we have this kind of blind spot in the, in the way we think. When you start running a business, you actually understand, you go, oh, well, well I just need to get people I know around me Whereas when you're doing it on your own, you just kind of, um, you just kind of like, all right, I'm just going to go, I'm going to go to the bank, um, see what I can do. And sometimes you can, you can get, you can get the loan. The bank will go, here's the loan and might be costing you an extra 20 grand a year. You don't know that. Um, and it was, yeah, I think the, the one thing when you run a business, you, you start understanding really quick. It's like, okay. I've got to get the right people around me because I've got so many blind spots. And I think if I, if I bring it, boil it down back to the individual, it applies to the individual as well. Like any wealthy person, just as advisors, like they're not experts in everything. And I think that's a mistake that, especially millennials, because we've got so much information, we're just trying to get all the information because we think that will make us an expert. Knowledge is power, right? But at the end of the day, it doesn't make us any better at making those, those decisions. And if you actually look at look at people who are wealthy, they just use advisors. The job of the advisor is just to give enough information to that wealthy person and their recommendations. And then the person makes that decision. I just wanted to highlight that contrast in like every day we're on the social media, we're getting notifications yeah. left, right and center. Wealthy people don't act like that. They just have a very limited amount of information that comes at them. And then they make decisions and, you know, they use the, the professionals to execute on those decisions. Spot on, Ed. So you're right. Everything is in this. Everyone's got one of these things in their pocket. Um, you jump up on the train now and you look across the entire carriage. There's not a single person that isn't on their mobile telephone. So you've got access to all this information. That, you're right. That doesn't mean you're a, an expert in a field. Just touching on industry experts that we and I preach about this regularly. But there are industry experts and there's industry experts. Um, some, and my, my opinion is for a mum and dad, um, purchaser, 
you're going to get difference of opinions from different, I'm a buyer's advocate. And I know that there are some buyer's advocates that preach for house and land packages for an investment property. I know some others will say apartments are good. There are so many different strategies for an investment properties that how does a poor mum and dad who have never done it before hearing different strategies from six different people, who do I go with? So my, my advice to most of them is follow your gut. You can find a trusted person who has some runs on the board, some experience, um, who are willing to open up their client books and and offer a phone call if if it will um, make a little bit of a difference to the to the mum and dad investor. Ask as many questions as you can. Don't don't just assume everybody because their social media page looks fantastic because they're saying the right things. Have a meeting with them. Sit down for an hour, hour and a half. Really get to the nitty gritty of it. Um, that will differentiate the real knowledge experts, uh, industry experts to those who are just pinching content from other other people across social media and using it for their own. If I'd add one thing to that is it's to take take your time. People online who are pitching you, especially when it's involving wealth, to get rich, that's their pitch. They've got an actual sell, sales process to get you to say yes there and then. There is an old way of selling and there's a new way of selling. A lot of these guys, maybe property spruikers, um, maybe they're just people that aren't the best businesses or providing the best service. Their sales pitch is quite often, yeah, I'll make you rich, but I won't actually show you how I'm doing it. So the, the transparency isn't there. But the new way of selling online is basically providing all the content. It's being transparent because at the end of the day, Michael, you can give all of the secret sauce that makes you good at doing your job. But at the end of the day, that individual client cannot execute because they haven't done it time and time again like you've done it. That would be my only advice to people. Like, And I see this all the time on the internet, people asking for advice on social media. I know it sounds funny, but that's what happens. And that's quite normal for people you know, especially under 40. But if you are one of those guys that ask financial questions online, just be aware you're going to get so many different answers. You're actually going to get put into a space where it's like, oh no, I'm paralyzed and I don't know what to do. Yep. So that's why I advise, um, take your time, chat to your experts. Personally, I believe trust is a big thing, especially with to, to do with finance and, and property and stuff like that. I actually tell clients that, that come to me for the first time, I say, look, I think trust is important because these are important lifetime decisions that you're making. If you don't trust me 100%, do not start out on, on that journey because it's a long journey together. You know, you've got finance for quite a long time usually. And if you're not trusting the people that are there to execute for you, you're going to be second guessing them. You're going to get stressed out because you don't trust them. I've done this time and time again, and you're better off taking your time up front making sure you've got the right people on your side when it is the right time to go, I should say, you've got these people that are ready to go and execute for you. And that execution should be actually way shorter than the rest of the time you've spent finding the right people, finding your A-team, making sure you trust them, sorting out your strategy, all that sort of stuff. Well, that's one of my biggest analogies at the moment is buying property is now a team sport. More than ever before, it is a team sport. When it doesn't matter if it's an investment property or if it's your owner-occupier. What does an owner occupier do when they decide they're going to buy a house? They go straight to realestate.com.au. 30% of the market sold before it even hits realestate.com.au because we get those listings. So they're not even getting exposed to the entire market. And there's still plenty of people who won't get a building pest inspection done. Just go back and explain that off market off um, market with sales. <laughs> yeah, not cool. getting it right. Because actually I, I get the clients and quite often I get them before they go to you. Yep. And most people do not actually understand that i would say 90 percent of people actually don't get that point so i just get you to reverse over and just kind of go over it a bit slower just so the audience understands kind of the benefit of you using you yep so off market and most people have heard of the term but you're right not a lot of people actually understand the application of it and how it works in the market so if you are about to sell your property we'll just we'll talk about it from the real estate agent side of things who's going to sell your property if you're a vendor with a real estate agent who's going to sell your property and there's an opportunity you can get your property sold for the price you want without having to spend any money on advertising costs. Go through the rigmarole of open home inspections, maintaining the cleanliness of the property so it's presented in the right manner. If you don't have to do any of that stuff and it's sold within three or four days to a week or two before it has to go to realestate.com, you'd be wrapped, wouldn't you? And the real estate agent who's selling it, that's a huge tick in his box because he's going to get a five-star review. So as a buyer's agent, when a sales agent gets the listing, once the contract's signed, we get that text message saying, this is what we've got. Does it suit anyone in your clientele base? And if it does, let's get them through. So as a buyer's agent, my clients, if it suits their brief, they get the first eyes on these properties. They get exclusive access. 
before everyone else jumps on the internet. Because jumping on the internet as step one means you've you've missed out on 30% of the opportunities out there. You're not actually being exposed to the entire market. Doesn't mean that we're going to buy an off-market property every single time. Because some of the off-market properties may not suit the client's brief than I have. It may suit a client's brief that another buyer's agent has. So the sales agents diversify their risk to a degree or increase the opportunities for themselves. They'll send it to a couple of their trusted buyers advocates and see if they can get it sold off market. If not, then they, they go to market and go through the full sales process. And that's where normal mums and dads will get access to them on, on the internet. There's a lot of uncertainty right now. I've got this saying that the only thing that's certain is uncertainty. Wow. And at the moment, I'm really getting that feeling. I'm getting people coming and they're just, we were talking before, um, the recording, they're changing their minds. You, like if, if you're talking to your mortgage broker, you, you're, you're already a fair way in, in, into the process. And if you're changing your mind, it just, to me, it's a big reflection of the uncertainty in the market. With that topic of uncertainty, there are a lot of people saying, especially first home buyers, let's focus on first home buyers for a second. Um, a lot of first home buyers saying, look, I don't, I don't know. I'm just going to put this on ice for the moment and revisit this in whatever, nine or 12 months. I would like to hear your opinions with this position. I'm curious. Tell me. Yeah, of no So, and there's a lot of variables involved. Um, the first home buyers, so this is where I'd work really closely with you, Will, um, being the mortgage broker for that first home buyer. So we can make sure that we don't put them in financial trouble. So if we know what their maximum expenditure is, we want to make sure there's a couple of buffers in here just in case the interest rates do happen to go up once or twice. Um, I do know that a couple of the big banks, Macquarie Bank being one, who are normally on the money, have uh, reduced their fixed interest rates mid-term and long-term. So they're, they are foreseeing the interest rates are going to drop. So for a first home buyer who doesn't get access to that, they rely on us. My personal take on it is if you have the borrowing capacity, even as a first home buyer, and you can service the loan, if you can pay for that loan with a buffer in there that is discussed with the client and they're comfortable, we're talking a 30 year, 20 to 30 year purchase. So not only is the property going to grow in that period of time, but when the market does settle in a year or two, whatever the case is, over time, they'll be laughing at the conversations we're having now because they'll be an asset that the family's had a chance to grow in. But it all comes back to that question one, can you, do you have the borrowing power? Do you have to put a strong budget in place for the next month or two just to ensure that? to ensure you can actually do have the capability to service the loan. And if you do, let's throw a little buffer in there and look at property prices maybe a tier or two down from from the maximum expenditure. That's probably where I would go with most of my first home buyers. A lot of people say I can spend six fifty, which is great. You don't want to spend six fifty if you don't have to. Because if you spend six fifty and the market and the interest rates go up, well, you might be in some trouble. So why don't we find a property that suits your needs if you're comfortable with it? at the 550 to 580 mark and you've left yourself a little buffer in there. What I get on my, like I can understand the uncertainty because people like, well, what if, what if the, the rates go up? Yep. Um, at the end of the day, you, you really need to budget for that. Like if, if you're um, getting into any debt at any time, that's actually something that you should be worried about. Yep. I think it just highlights the times that we've lived through where people haven't worried about that risk because that risk is actually always there hundred percent of the time. Um, if you've got debt, but like you, that, like you said, I think you've got, there's things you can do to mitigate it. So obviously running a good budget, if you've got a bit of a cash buffer there, um, that always helps because you know, you've got what if money, what if kind of, you know, the back gives out or whatever. Yes. <laughs> um, I don't, I don't know. In terms of like, there's a, I know there's a lot of people thinking, oh, it'll go down more and then I'll have, you know, I'll, I'll buy that same property for a hundred grand less, for example. And I know there's a lot of people doing that. And I wish they wouldn't. what's that? I wish they wouldn't do that. Yeah. And I'll explain why, because when interest rates drop, the market is flooded with buyers. And then you've got the, the biggest driver of property prices is supply versus demand. When you've got a flood of buyers coming in the market because the interest rates have dropped to a level that they're comfortable with, well, then they're all competing for the same property. So the property that's worth 600 now is not going to be worth 600 in six to 12 months when interest rates come down. So they're the sort of educational factors that we like to, to speak when we speak to our clients. We want to make sure they're aware of that. I've got one now um, who I'm in discussions with who wants to buy an investment property, but wants to make sure that he can afford it, which is fantastic. His theory though is, I'll just wait until the interest rates drop. 
And I've had to say to him, there's a high like high chance that that property is not going to be worth what you're paying now for it when you're ready in six months or 12 months. It will go up because mm-hmm. buyers are coming to the market. So it's I, I completely appreciate their standpoint. And a lot of that's driven by fear, which is completely understandable. Uh, but yeah, that's that's one thing that I like to explain to them just so they're aware of it. Oh, I'm not a pushy buyer's agent. At the end of the day, it's their decision. I just want to make sure they've got the full picture. Um, I've sent them if you haven't sent them to me, I'm sending them to you if they haven't got a, a good mortgage broker. So you can give them all the education around what that loan looks like, what their borrowing power is, what the payments are, what the interest rate outlook could be. Then I would take them back and then we'd have the discussion around what's triggering the property prices where they are. And currently, I live down here in Geelong. There are auctions. It's a really funny market at the moment. Turned up to a couple of auctions, was bidding at one, just uh, was a spectator at the other. Both properties should have been sold under the hammer, well and truly. And my um, colleagues, other buyers agents in the area, also the same. Yet both got passed in and negotiated a sale price in the in the living room post auction. It's a really funny market at the moment out here. So I think it's because, as you said, a lot of people are waiting. Um, but when they all decide, hey, I'm comfortable, they're all going to hit the market looking for property at the same time, and that's going to drive prices higher. What I've observed is that people that just jump in, and I get these clients all the time, right? They just jump in. And yep. like, what about the risk? What about this? What about that? Actually, they've been rewarded more than the people that are like myself and kind of very cautious. That goes against every grain in my body to say. If you take the emotion aside and you look at what's actually happening, that's actually what's happening. If you take the other side of that and go, oh, what if it does drop a hundred grand or whatever and I could get it cheaper? I would say to that, no, if you go go to anyone that's a, a, an investor in the stock market and you ask them to pick the bottom of any stock, they'll say that's almost impossible. You basically learn how to make money if you know how to do that. And if that's the case, you don't need to borrow money. <laughs> I'd had those questions every week. I was getting that same question. When's the, when's it going to bottom out? When's it going to bottom out? And I said to them, you'll be the last person to know it bottoms out. It's already on its way up. So it comes back yeah. with, if you've got the borrowing power, jump in now. It's a 30 year investment. That way you're guaranteed to capture the entire capital growth of that upswing mm. um, when it does bottom out, but it will apply. He couldn't pick the bottom. Yeah. I think the most the most recent example on my side is actually at the start of the pandemic when it when it came out. Like, you know, mass uncertainty, mass fear, mass mass panic, mass lockdowns. I literally had customers that obviously they stole they stole the market going back up, but that, that fear stopped them. Yes. And we're in a pretty, pretty low market here. Like properties went from probably around that five hundred mark in the lower part of the market and then boom up to six fifty within quick time. And I have clients then that just you know they just couldn't get back in or to get back in they just needed a lot more deposit and a lot more lending if you zoom out a little bit more you you see that well even if you bought at the high of um the gfc for example sure a drop but long term and that's why we're buying property for long term the inflation in the asset value of real estate takes care of the actual finance the acquiring of it over a long period of time in my opinion is probably more important because if you don't have the property then you don't get the don't get the capital gain and i get it like i know that you look at my content and i'm always watch out for the debt because the debt's going to trap you because it's been around for thousands of years and that's how people get caught but at the same time you need to balance that and you still need to own in my opinion assets not just real estate but as a general rule You've got to balance that risk of debt with, with owning assets as well. And in my opinion, I think people borrow and they don't get enough bang from their asset. Um, I think that's actually in, in the next kind of five years or to the end of the decade, I think that that risk is going to show itself in some way or another. I agree, man. It also depends what asset you're buying. I know of so many working on the wharf, we earned some good money and there was always an 18, 19, 20 year old who would go out and buy a $120,000 car with a car. I love buying a Ranger, mate. My Lord. Hitting bells and whistles. And I just shake my head. I'm like, go buy yourself a $20,000, $30,000 car that's just as good to drive and put the rest of the money aside or to a deposit for a property. At least you're going to get an appreciating asset as opposed to a depreciating asset. And their education pieces I'm giving first home buyers regularly too. Where is your money going? Oh, we've got a car load for this much. Oh my God. Or we've got a credit card that has $15,000 on it. We don't owe a cent, but they don't understand that still impacts your borrowing capacity. You would see that regularly. I love that they're buying assets, but rather buy the right assets. And whether that's property or not property, buy the right assets. No right, no wrong answer here, I don't think. 
you could probably think of some wrong answers, actually. I'm nervous. Let's say you're 30 or 35 and, and you've got all these these problems, the ones I was talking about before, paying off your, your home loan or getting a home loan if you don't have one, yep. um, and then making sure you've got enough income for retirement at the end of you doing everything you want to do in your life. Just a couple of basic points, like just dot points of recommendations you could give in how people would get the right mindset or approach that kind of challenge in, in, in a particular way. So, and there's a, a couple of variables that would be around that is in the family situation. Are they growing their families? Are there going to be more children come on board? Because that's going to impact their finances. Children are bloody expensive. But the biggest thing for me is to make sure that they have a plan. So if you are looking at property as an investment strategy, what's your ultimate goal? When you retire at your preservation age of 60, 65, whatever it is, what do you want that to look like? What passive income are you going to be satisfied with? And then we reverse engineer it if it's a property space. We will plug in purchases across that path. And that plan, it can be fluid because things happen in life. I personally went through a divorce, which set me back to sort of square one. We were, we were on an investment path, but the divorce meant shit. We're back in square one, unfortunately. So then you have to go back and, and put another plan in place. But for me, planning, if you, what's that saying? If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. So find out what retirement looks like for you and reverse engineer that. And then we can we can move forward on that goal. So if it includes making sure that you are budgeting and not overreaching, if you need a certain amount for a deposit, picking the right assets. So we're after a growth property, then we're after a higher yielding asset to mutually gear that portfolio. All that's done in the planning phase. So for me, it's, it's probably planning. That is the biggest tip I can give someone. Plan to what you want that future to look like when you retire. 100%, mate. And just to add on to that, the planning is important because, for example, a client will come to me and go, oh, I want a portfolio of 10 houses and they're yep. all going to be around Melbourne. And I'm like, well, good luck because you probably can't afford two properties. And then yeah. over a period of time, maybe we can get you to five. So... But a lot of people don't know too. So you buy 10 properties in Victoria, there's an added tax that's thrown on that. You yeah. you reach a trigger that a lot of people go, I didn't know that existed. So you need to diversify that nationwide and be a borderless investor just to make sure you're getting the maximum from a tax point of view. Yeah, I think the point I'm trying to make is, and the reason you want to think long-term is to actually reverse engineer it, um, like I said before, because if you can't reverse engineer it, your plan actually doesn't work. Like there's, there's no... There's no reality behind what you're trying to do. The problem I see people, when I push back, they just go, yeah, but I'll have a pile of money at the end of it. If you had a pile of money now, it just inflated. It just lost 30% of the purchasing power seeing your bank account over three years' time. So yeah, people don't understand that either. They don't understand the devaluing of the dollar when the inflation, when the interest rates do what they do. That's an education piece. But yeah, so that plan is pivotal. Uh, absolutely pivotal. And people who don't put a plan in place and just say, I want to buy an investment property. Excellent. What for? What are we trying to achieve here? Oh, I just want one. Or my mum said to get one. My mates have got one and they said it's a great idea. That's fine, but we need to dig deeper into that. We need to unpack that further and, and find out what you actually want to achieve from it. Because the costs to buy in and out over a short period of time are so expensive. We're talking half billion dollar asset sort of at a minimum. So the purchase prop costs and the selling costs, if you're not keeping that asset for a long period of time, it's, it's substantial. So anyone who thinks they're going to get rich investing in property, they're not looking at property. They should be looking at something like crypto as their risk. Uh, if they're looking at a risky asset. Talk to me if you want to buy crypto. No, don't do that. <laughs> I'm more comfortable with the sustained growth in a property, knowing what the outcome is going to be. Yes, there's going to be dips and peaks and troughs throughout that, that investment period, and there's going to be hurdles. But at the end of the day, you buy an asset now, if it's the right asset, you know it's going to be worth a lot more uh, when you're going to move that asset on. Well, rookie mistakes that buyers make. There is a lot of rookie mistakes. Rookie mistake number one. One um, this weekend, I get on a lot of weekends actually, and that is, hey, I'm putting an offer down on this house. Can I get the loan? Don't do that. If you want to work with firstly a good broker, I know if it was me, I would have reservations about doing it, especially if you, if you put the offer in for the house and you want it because um, potentially um, there's a deadline there that we can't match. Really, my advice is, is you should be dealing with the experts at the start and they should be guiding you on the process because that's going to ensure you the best um, chance of getting property that you want. For example, if you buy a house, you can't get the finance in time and the vendor wants to bail out on, on, on the finance and that's your dream property, you've lost it. Too bad. Because you should have done all of the stuff at the start so that once you bought the house, you sign the contract, the finance is done and it's all wrapped up as soon as possible. Second rookie error I would say is that people don't understand the actual 
process of going out to buy a house. They think it's like on the TV and they get all excited. And don't get me wrong, it, it is excited. I love the excitement. I feed off the excitement. But I also get six weeks later when they're like, well, I'm tired. All of my weekends, we've just been looking at houses after houses. And the ones we want, they all get, uh, we get outbidded because we, you know, whatever reason, they get outbidded. So obviously you've got BAs, bio, bio advocates, um, like Michael, that kind of um, help you buy that property. But th that would be the main mistake that I see people make is they just don't understand the buying process. And they don't know how to price a property which means they're not putting in the right bids and then they just, they really fall out of love with the home buying process. Bidding emotionally at auctions. And it comes down, you, uh, you bought that property. You, if it's, if you bought it at auction, there's no, there's no, um, subject to finance. There's none of that sort of stuff. It is hammered down. You go in and sign that contract or you're in a world of hurt. And potentially a world of stress. That too. I guarantee they both go hand in hand around that. Yeah, that that is a common one, and the the situation where maybe they haven't done a building and pest on the on the property, maybe they've just got the they got they got emotionally attached to this property, and um, they just won't let go. Yep. Well, there's I know a couple who have bought two or three building pest inspections before an auction, failed at all three auctions. So the next two auctions they didn't buy one, and they were just bidding. And I thought I do, I understand why they didn't want to spend the extra money in case they missed out again, but. You're buying these are eight hundred and fifty thousand dollar houses. If there is any damage through being termites or boring or um, floor structures that are not um, up to standard or non-compliant, if there are any footings under the the house that need to be fixed, stumps, God, there are so many issues with properties that if you don't get these done professionally, you you could be in so much trouble financially and stress. I know about the stress. You can see the you can see that light shining off off my head. That's stress, mate. None of it's alcohol related. <laughs> I love that. That is brilliant. Before we wrap up, where can people find you? I know you're on Instagram. So my Insta is uh, at SimsPG, S-I-M-M-S, uh, PG. Michael Sims is the LinkedIn and I've got a Facebook page. But well, my website is www.simspg.com.au um, and that runs through all of our services, uh, who we can help and um, it tells a bit about who I am. I'm, I'm big on building relationships with clients. I don't want it to just be a transactional um, service. I want it to be something more. I want it to take them on that journey and be part of that process with their families. As if you need any help with buying a property, get onto Michael. Links are below. Also give him a follow on the socials. Thank you. If you need help with money, my details are below. Cheers.